Um, you'll enjoy this. There's some nice algebra in here. Um, now, uh, Rutherford, very famous guy, we had his <laughs> centenary, the centenary of his uh, um, was celebrated last year, the year before, I can't remember. <coughs> But he's the guy who came up with the nuclear model of the atom, right? That it wasn't electrons and protons all sort of jumbled up in one lump. Uh, the protons, <coughs> the mass, was all in this tiny, tiny part in the middle of an atom, and the electrons were distributed much, much more widely uh, around the outside. Uh, and Niels Bohr was a very, very clever guy who spent time working with Rutherford and came up with what is probably the most instructive, at least first start, uh, model for how all this works. So he began having, through Rutherford, established this model for an atom, positive charge in the middle, negative charges around the outside. Uh, he basically said, well, let's make it really simple. Uh, let's consider that we've got our positively charged nucleus and we've got electrons orbiting in circular orbits. Let's keep it really, really simple uh, around that nucleus. Okay? And now where does the mass lead us? And that's essentially where he started. So all he really needed to do was to balance a couple of forces. These are stable orbits, if you like. <coughs> Unless we put additional energy in, they don't change. Which means that the attractive force, the electrostatic force between our negative electron and our positive uh, nucleus must be balanced by something. Right? And it's balanced, of course, by the fact that these things are moving around in a circle. So there is a centripetal force. This is like a spin dryer throwing the water to the outside of the drum. Right? So there's a centripetal force which is tending to force the electron away because it's moving in a circle and there's an electrostatic force which is trying to drag it into the centre again. So the very first thing he did um, was to write down the equations and he didn't devise these. These have been around for some considerable time. Coulomb generated the, uh, the lower one on here for the electrostatic <coughs> force which basically says that it is the multiple of the charge on the electron so minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, multiplied by the charge on the proton for hydrogen. And we're only going to think about hydrogen here. All right, one proton, one electron. So this is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then divided by 4 pi r squared. What's 4 pi r squared? Think of circles, but think 3D. Yeah, area of a sphere. Right. So why do you think we might have 4 pi r squared on the bottom when we're thinking about forces? This is an aside, right? I'm not expecting you to remember this. It moves around fast enough that you can pretty much treat it as being evenly distributed. Oh, yeah, no, I'm leaving that aside. You're, you're right, but that's not the key. It, this, is, this is an example of what you will come across time, time, and time again. Yeah. The uh, force from the nucleus is spherical. It is. It's going out the same in all directions, right? The electrostatic <coughs> uh, attraction <coughs> is certainly that. The point is, here's our positive nucleus, and here's our, right, I'm drawing it as a circle, but imagine it as a sphere. If we've got a force at some distance coming out to this shell around the outside, right, you can imagine its effect spread over the entire surface area of that sphere. So if you change the radius, exactly the same force is now spread over a bigger surface area. Right? So per unit area, at any point on the surface, it's gone down. This is why you run away from radioactive sources. Further away you get, 
the less radiation events are reaching your body per second because you're now a smaller part of the area of the sphere surrounding that radioactive source. Right? There's only a finite number of, I don't know what it is, gamma rays coming out of this source. And those are now spreading out across bigger and bigger and bigger spheres as you get further and further away from it. Okay, it's saying exactly the same sort of thing here. The force gets less as you move further away. And you think about it in this spherical way. Epsilon naught at the bottom here is the permittivity of free space or the permittivity of vacuum. Textbooks will switch between the two. Uh, and that's essentially telling you how effective is the medium at transmitting that force. All right? If we had something other than vacuum here, we'd have something called the relative permittivity. It would just describe the effectiveness of whatever that intervening material is. So here's the Coulomb force. So it's proportional to a multiple of the charges involved, and there's this bunch of stuff on the bottom, which is essentially saying this is taking place over a spherical surface. Right, now we have our centripetal force. This is spin dryer. This is the effect you feel when a car goes around a bend in a road. Exactly the same equation. Uh, it's just mv squared <coughs> over r. The minus sign is simply telling us that uh, the centripetal force is always towards the center of the orbit, but the minus sign is telling us that the effect in this case would actually be to throw the electron out the other way. Right, so it's offering it, uh, um, acting in the opposite direction, as it were. All right, so it's proportional to the square of the angular speed and one over the radius. Yeah. So that's our centripetal force, and as I say, again, it's a universal equation. This is not something that Bohr dreamed up. Uh, he didn't have spin dryers, he didn't drive around bends too fast in a car, but it explains all sorts of things. It explains anything that you spin around your head on a piece of string. All right? it's, uh, this is the equation that will tell you what the force involved in that is. Uh, in that case, R would just be the length of the piece of string. Right? And this is the mass of the object. So in this case, this is the force that is uh, essentially trying to throw the electron out. And this therefore must be the electron mass. This is the radius of the orbit. This is its angular speed. The Coulomb force is trying to put it <coughs> inwards. So it's related to charges and again to the radius of the orbit. Right, now this is a stable orbit, remember. <coughs> it is not changing in radius, up or down. And it will only change up if we put more energy into the system. Left to its own devices in its ground state, these two forces must be balanced. They must be precisely balanced. The force throwing the electron out and the force dragging it in must be the same. So the obvious next step is to combine them in that way. Make one equal to the other. And then we can rearrange that very straightforwardly. We want to find the <coughs> angular velocity in this case. So we're just going to move this stuff to the other side. And this is what we get. Now this E squared, remember, and always, always, always hang on to this fact. It's really, really important. This is made up of charge on the proton multiplied by charge on the electron. Yes? <coughs> And the reason I'm stressing this is that if we start thinking about atoms other than hydrogen, there will be more than one proton. So we'd end up with <coughs> minus E times some multiple of plus E. Right? For helium, it would be minus E for one electron times two E, two protons. So always keep that in mind. But anyway, we're sticking with hydrogen for now. So here's our equation. We've now got angular speed uh, in terms of a whole bunch of constants and the radius of the orbit. Okay, 
Now, the very, very key step that Bohr made, absolutely crucial, and the genius spark that went into this, uh, was his realisation and working assumption that the angular momentum of the electron in the orbit was quantized. Um, angular momentum is, again, it's, it's not an equation Bohr invented. It's been around for a long, long time. Right? Momentum in a straight line is just mass times velocity. Right? Angular momentum is mass times velocity uh, multiplied by the radius <coughs> of the orbit. So it's a very closely related equation. And what Bohr said is that this angular momentum <coughs> can only take certain values. <coughs> and he quantized them in terms of what was then a relatively no novel uh, uh, constant being used all over the place. We've used it over here. Um, he said it's quantized in multiples of Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Right, the 2 pi is not entirely random. Uh, it comes from the fact that in one complete circle we've got 2 pi radians. All right? Those, these are the units that he was working in. You'll see it in some textbooks written in this form, H with a bar across the top. All right, just to tip you off. So essentially he's saying the angular momentum must be a certain number of H over 2 pi units. Right, and n can be one or two or three or four. This is the quantum number that we introduced last week. All right, so this really is the beginnings of quantum mechanics. Our angular momentum can only exist in multiples of this quantity. That was Bohr's starting position for the next step in here. So this is great now. We've got a couple of simultaneous equations. We can get angular velocity from here and we can substitute it in there. <coughs> yeah? So that's our next step. <coughs> and if we do that, we get an equation that tells us what the radius of the orbit is. So it's just a whole bunch of constants in here. Planck's constant, permittivity of vacuum, pi, mass of the electron, charge on the electron and charge on the proton. These are all things we can just put in as numbers. The interesting bit is this, the fact that we now are obliged to carry through this quantum number. <coughs> now it's squared in this case <coughs> because of the solution of the simultaneous equation. It just comes out that way. But n, remember, must be 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So in other words, the radii for ground state, n is 1. So that gives us the ground state radius of the orbit of the electron around hydrogen. Which is actually telling us how big is a hydrogen atom. Uh, if we excite that electron to the next state, so n equals 2, the radius is actually four times that. It's actually moved out a long way. And then if we go to n equals 3, it's 9 times the ground state radius, and then 16 times the ground state radius, and so on and so on and so on. Just because we're stepping this number up, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So if we put the numbers in for the hydrogen ground state, so n equals 1, right? so all I'm doing is putting in these basic constants, I get a value that's about 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 of a metre. 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11, as it shows on there. This is the radius, remember, so to get a diameter, you'd have to double it. Right? What did we say the ballpark size of atoms is? and the separation between atoms, it's something times 10 to the minus 10 of a metre. And actually, this is not bad, right? If you get a little bit more sophisticated in your theory, you come up with something that is, um, you know, only different by about 10%. So considering the simplicity of the approximations, electrons in circular orbits, etc., etc., 
this is actually pretty good. So all we've done is to make some very basic physics type assumptions. We've invoked the electrostatic attraction between positive and negative charges. We've invoked <coughs> the equation that tells us about centripetal force. And we've invoked the equation that tells us about angular momentum. The only additional spark we needed was the statement that the angular momentum is quantized. Everything else was algebra. Right? Nothing else. So, there we are. We can calculate the size of a hydrogen atom. We can go further than this. How are we doing for time? Good. Having got the radius, we can now think a little bit more broadly. We've been looking, remember, in terms of, of transitions and so on, exclusively in terms of energy. So can we calculate now the energy associated uh, with these quantized orbits? Well, we need to put some additional information in. If we want the energy, we've got to consider kinetic energy and potential energy, and then add the two together. Well, kinetic energy is easy. Right? It's just half mv squared. And we know what v squared is. We've already got an equation for v squared. So we can plug that straight in. So the kinetic energy of our electron in hydrogen is now given very straightforwardly by this expression at the end. Again, just a whole bunch of constants with the radius of the orbit. <coughs> the potential, <coughs> excuse me, potential energy I'm not going to derive for you. It's a little bit complicated to do at this stage. Um, Although we can generate it from the force, remember. Potential energy and force were related by calculus. We established that when we were looking at interatomic forces. So we can do it. But the potential energy is actually given by this equation here. And again, it's loads of constants and the radius of the orbit. So all we've got to do is to add that to that. And that gives us our total energy. <coughs> and that's what's happening on the top line up here. So the total energy of our electron is given by this equation. Okay, and again, you'll notice that the quantum number has to be in that equation because we already know that the radius depends upon the quantum number. We've produced that equation already. And so the energy depends on the quantum number. This, you'll remember, was proportional to n squared. So the energy has to be inversely proportional to n squared. Yeah? So if we want to look at the ground state of hydrogen, we just put n equals 1 in, so we stick our value of the radius that we determined on the <coughs> previous slide, uh, previous but one slide in there, we'll end up with a number. So the energy of the ground state of our electron in hydrogen is given as 21.7 times 10 to the minus 19 of a joule, which we can convert to 13.6 uh, electron volts. Now, let's flick back a few slides just to re-trigger your memory. Right? This, remember, was just an empirical equation. This was a number that fitted the data. <coughs> when Barmer was producing this equation, he didn't know where it came from. Now we do. This is associated with the energy of the ground state of the electron in hydrogen. That is where that number comes from. And that is why we've got 1 over the square of quantum numbers in the bracket. It's because of this bit of um, whoops, algebra that we've just done. Energy is proportional to 1 over the radius of the orbit, and the radius of the orbit is proportional to n squared. So that equation that Barmer came out with entirely empirically, just trying to explain the numbers in his data, actually you can derive theoretically using what is a really, really straightforward model of the atom. 
and I stress again we're talking exclusively about hydrogen for now okay so you can work out the energy levels of all the levels in hydrogen N equals 1 is 13.6 <coughs> electron volts, so N equals 2 will be 13.6 divided by 2 squared, divided by 4. N <coughs> equals 3 will be 13.6 divided by 9. N equals 4 will be 13.6 divided by 16, right? and so on and so on and so on. And that tells us, of course, immediately why the spacing between these energies, energy levels gets smaller and smaller and smaller as M goes up. Because the gap between 1 over 2 squared and 1 over 3 squared is much bigger than the gap between 1 over 3 squared and 1 over 4 squared. And so on and so on. Right? Everyone following the logic? Good. Okay, now, if we go right back to the beginning of this section of the module, we started talking about ionization potentials and ionization energy. Okay, so if we've calculated the ground state energy, the N equals 1 level in hydrogen, remember I said that you could conceive of um, the ionization energy as, you know, being roughly when N equals infinity. Right, it gets to a very large number. Okay, so if we're going to divide 13.6 by n squared to get our nth energy level, and n is now very, very, very large indeed, we're getting close to an energy of zero. Okay, so essentially what we've calculated is the ionization energy of hydrogen also. <coughs> If we put in the full 13.6 electron volts, we could remove the, uh, the electron from the hydrogen altogether. And we just end up with an H plus ion, which of course in the case of hydrogen is proton. Right? It's actually a very common way of creating a proton beam. <coughs> just ionize hydrogen. Yeah? Good. Um, I think we've done everything we need to do on that now. So that's our major bit of this morning. That's the key bits of algebra that we need to worry about. So just to tidy up, I'm going to stray a little bit beyond, but only to whet your appetite, all right? Sadly, we don't have the time, and you don't actually have the maths yet, uh, to go much, much deeper in quantum mechanics. You're going to need to build up an armory uh, for yourself before you can go too much further into there. But um, there are limitations to the Bohr model. All right? I've hinted at them already. We can't move from hydrogen, basically, uh, because unless we only have one electron, we're stumped. Anyone care to postulate why that might be the case? What if we just move one element along the periodic table? We just went to helium. Yeah. Just has two it's electrons. Sorry? It's well, it's, it's, it's more basic than that. You're right, but it is, it's more fundamental than that. Think about what we did to produce the equations we got for hydrogen. Assume the electron shell was spherical. Yep, we did. More basic still. Would the electrons be repelling each other? Yeah, that's it. We had a really simple force set up. We just had a centripetal force and a force between one negative charge and one positive charge. If we move to helium, we've got a second negative charge somewhere else. So we've not only got this attractive electrostatic force, but now we've got a repulsive electro electrostatic force between the two electrons as well. So it gets hugely complicated. So the only way we can think about helium, and we can do this, uh, of course, is to ionize it. So if we turn it to helium plus, it's now only got one electron again. So life is simple. <coughs> It has two protons still in the nucleus, but that's okay. 
we now just still have one attractive electrostatic force, this time between the single remaining electron and two protons in the nucleus. So the top line of that initial fraction that I gave you for the electrostatic force would now be minus E times 2E. Everything else would be the same. So you could actually go away now and work out what the excitation spectrum for a helium plus ion would be. So it's 2E not E squared. No, it's minus E for the electron multiplied by T, 2E. So it would be minus 2E squared. Yeah? So those of you who really are keen can actually go in do that. Or I might just set you a question to do it. That would be fun. Um, <coughs> so anyway, then we have to get into quantum mechanics proper, actually, if we're going to do anything beyond uh, what we've done. And there's a lot of people worked on this. The 1930s was a particularly energetic decade for people working on quantum mechanics. The birth of the quantum mechanics really uh, started, I suppose, late 20s. And then in the 1930s, there was a bit of... Uh, a um, bit of an explosion in the area. Um, and we've been over this to some degree already. I mean, we're, all we're saying now is that we can't think of an electron as a point like particle. We have to be a bit more sophisticated. It might be spread over space. So we don't talk about orbits now, we talk about orbitals. So they're shells that are not sharp, they're <coughs> fuzzy. Uh, and there's all sorts of stuff out there on the web you can look up if you want to as well, reliable things. So, you know, teaching courses in other universities and so on that have been put on the web. Um, I can't remember if I showed you this image before, did I? Yeah, okay. So it's just illustrating 